So step number one for avoiding the collapse of civilization is try not to cough on one another. Okay, so, so this is a virus, and disease epidemics caused by microbes like this, viruses and also bacteria, these are the things that precipitated the fall of the Roman Empire and of the Golden Age of Athens and of most of the empires of the Native Americans. And it's sort of surprising that when you look at the largest threat to the survival of civilizations, it's something so small. And in fact, it's so invisibly small that viruses and bacteria weren't understood until very recently in history. And yet, despite their, their small size, these have caused more death and destruction than all the famines and wars put together. Um, so, take, take as an example uh, smallpox, which, is, which was the most destructive disease in history. It's killed hundreds of millions of people between ancient times and 1977, when it was finally eradicated. Um, the Romans lost up to a third of their population in parts of their empire. Uh, and about a millennium later, what happened is the Crusaders came back from pillaging distant lands, and they brought an epidemic of smallpox to Europe. Europeans then went over to the New World. They brought uh, smallpox to the New World, and, and in doing so, devastated the, the Incas and the Mayans and other natives there. Um, and some of you may know, in 1707, smallpox wiped out a third of Iceland. Um, so, similarly, the, the Black Plague, Yersinia pestis, um, this wiped out a third of Europe starting in 1347, and then it kept coming back to haunt Europe century after century. Um, yellow fever so badly decimated Napoleon's armies in Haiti that Napoleon gave up the idea of having a Western French Empire just because of yellow fever. Because of his 22,000 crack soldiers that he'd sent to Haiti, 21,000 of them died. And, and, and so he gave up, and, and that's why Napoleon sold the Louisiana Territory to the United States. Because he finally, he, he said, I just don't want to be running this show con confronting diseases that I no longer understand. So he, um, he sold it for roughly five cents an acre, which in a bloodless man manner doubled the size of the United States. Okay, and so it goes on and on. There are, there are these viruses and bacteria that have really navigated the course of history in major ways. And what I'm going to suggest is that the internet is really our key to survival here. Um, and this is for three reasons. First, what the internet gives us is the ability to work remotely. And when you can work from home telepresently, what this allows you to do is, is inhibit viral transmission by reducing face-to-face -face contact, the human-to-human -human contact. So in, in the face, <laughs> so here's the idea. The next time that there's a really killer virus coming our way, if businesses are prepared in advance, what they can do is really leverage telepresence to keep supply chains running with the maximum number of employees working from home. Now, this isn't going to keep everybody off the street, um, but it's going to vastly reduce the density. And it turns out that when it comes to epidemics, that's all you need to do. You just need to get things below a tipping point. So uh, the reason viruses have this sort of tipping point is because uh, viruses have a limited lifetime and a certain probability of infecting somebody. And so if you have very low host density, then the virus dies before it can get to a new host. But as soon as you get enough people together, then it can find new hosts and you go from some sort of equilibrium state into an epidemic. It really blows up. And in fact, you can see this sort of thing happening every Christmas holiday season with people shopping in the malls because they all bunch together and then you cross over this population tipping point and then everyone gets flu and cold. Okay, so now here's the problem. In the past, societies have reacted to epidemics by bunching together. So, for example, um, in medieval Europe, when the Black Plague hit and other plagues like it, um, warring religious factions who spent all their time killing each other would, would show solidarity in the face of all this death by marching together in the streets together to show that the Catholics and the Protestants could be friends in the face of the plague. Well, that was a real misstep in terms of density. Um, and it turns out that the Native Americans, in a show of goodwill, they would gather in the tents of people who were infected with smallpox. Everyone would gather together, and again, unfortunately, that was um, a gesture that uh, was sort of ill-fated. 
And so this is exactly the fear that all major medical centers have the next time we have a major uh, a new strain hitting us, whether it's avian flu or swine flu or something, the big fear that medical centers have is that everybody with a cough is going to come flocking into the med center to get checked out. And this is really dangerous. And so I think this is the second great opportunity afforded to us by the net, besides telepresence, is, is telemedicine, whereby with increasingly sophisticated technologies, we don't have to have uh, patients coming in and bunching up together, but instead we can have diagnosis from a distance. Okay, so the telepresence and the telemedicine are very useful because they keep the population density below a tipping point. I think there's a third benefit that we get from the internet, which is we can optimally direct resources when there is an outbreak. So uh, you may know that the Center for Disease Control tracks the flu uh, by tracking what happens at the local hospitals. Now the thing is it takes two weeks for the CDC to put together their report. It lags the actual flu outbreak by two weeks. So Google came up with a better idea, and what they do is they track where people are searching for terms related to the flu. So if they're searching for information on symptoms or medicines or something, it turns out that over the course of the nation, that serves as an excellent proxy for where there's a flu outbreak. So while the CDC's report lags by two weeks, Google's lags by only a day. So this gives us a very rapid way to know dynamically exactly where the flu is and where the outbreaks are, are, are happening. Okay, so um, unlike previous generations that were brought down by disease, especially because they didn't know how to react in terms of density and sparseness, we can now do better because of the internet. If we're well prepared, when the next ep epidemic arrives, we can fluidly shift into a self-quarantined, telepresent society in which the microbes fail by dint of host sparseness. And so um, there's a lot of talk, of course, about the ills of social isolation and everybody sitting on Facebook. But whatever those ills are, it bodes a lot worse for the microbes than it does for us. So although we're well into this step, there's, there's work to be done if we want to save our civilization. Businesses really need to work on developing their disaster plans um, and, and, and their work from home epidemic plans. Uh, I wrote a paper on this in the journal Nature about five years ago, and I've been watching as businesses have been doing this. I've been monitoring sort of how this is going. Some businesses are doing it. Most aren't still. It's really important to try to get businesses to do this, and it's extremely easy to test, right, to work out the kinks by having everybody work from home. And then the second thing as a society, we really need to keep developing telemedicine and similar ideas like that. Mm -hmm.